In this webinar series, we'll learn how and why we study nature in Los Angeles and hear from a different museum staff member who will give us a glimpse into their day-to-day -day work at the museum. Today, we'll be hearing from Leela Higgins, Senior Manager of Community Science. Before we meet our guests, though, we're going to start with a quick warm up activity that'll get us thinking about all of the different kinds of wildlife that we share this amazing city with. On the following slides, I'm going to show pictures of a bunch of different types of animals. Your job will be to guess whether the animal in the picture is one that can be found in Los Angeles. If you're watching with somebody else, you can challenge one another, say your guesses out loud at home. You can also keep track of your guesses in your journal or type what you think into the chat. I'm going to share all of the answers at the end of the game. Are you all ready to play? All right, so our first animal is a raccoon. Do raccoons live in Los Angeles? Yes or no, what do we think? All right, I'm seeing some answers come in the chat. Let's see our next animal. We've got two southern alligator lizards in this picture. Are these an animal that we can find in Los Angeles? What do you think? Okay, seeing some answers come in. All right, moving right along. This is called a mitered parakeet. Do you think this is an animal that can be found in Los Angeles? All right. What about these short beaked common dolphins? Are short beaked common dolphins an animal that can be found in Los Angeles? Thanks so much for sharing your answers in the chat. All right, we got an insect. This is an American sand wasp. I love its beautiful blue colors. Do we think we can find this in Los Angeles? Mm, look at this cool bird. This is an osprey. Do you think ospreys can be found in Los Angeles? What about this guy? This is a black bear. Are black bears an animal that could be found in Los Angeles? That's a pretty cute picture. All right, what about this guy? This is a free-tailed bat. Do we think free-tailed bats flying around in Los Angeles? All right, what about this one? This is a monarch butterfly. Are monarch butterflies an animal we could find in Los Angeles? Right, next up, we have a Mediterranean house gecko. We have Mediterranean house geckos in Los Angeles. How about green sea turtles? Do green sea turtles live in Los Angeles? What do you think? All right, and our final question, this mountain lion. Do we find mountain lions in Los Angeles? What do you think? All right, my friends, that was our last question. Thank you so much for playing today. Um, I said I would reveal our answers at the end. Um, and I think maybe some people will be surprised to hear that all of the animals we saw in those pictures are animals that can be found in and around Los Angeles. So every single one of those animals is one that lives in Los Angeles. Um, and even cooler, all of those pictures were taken by regular people who live in this city. Uh, so today, we're going to be meeting with Leela Higgins, who is Senior Manager of Community Science at NHM. I'm going to let Leela tell you a little bit more about what that means. Hi, Leela. Hi, everyone. My name is Leela Higgins. As Lindsay said, I am the Community Science Program, of the, which basically means um, working with people like you, regular people who are not paid scientists to answer real world questions about nature in LA. So that's what community science means. Some other people around the world call it citizen science, but we want to be as inclusive as possible. 
I'm not a citizen of the United States, so we call it community science at our museum. We're super happy to have you with us today, Leela. And I mentioned to all of our participants that this is our first of eight webinars where we'll be exploring how and why NHM studies and shares stories of nature in LA. We just finished up a game trying to guess which of the animals in the pictures lived in LA, and we learned that all of them do. Um, could you start by telling us a little bit about how and why the nature in LA is special, Leela? Yeah, so I'm going to share from a book that I wrote uh, called Wild LA. Some of you might have seen it or heard of it or got it out from the library, or maybe you even own it at home. So I'm going to share why nature in LA is so amazing. So we have a few claims to fame. Los Angeles is the only city in the United States with a major mountain range running through it. Thank you, Santa Monica Mountains. Griffith Park is in the Santa Monica Mountains. LA County has the greatest difference between its lowest and highest points of any county in the United States, ranging from sea level, which is zero, to 10,064 feet at the top of Mount Baldy. Los Angeles is the birdiest county in the country with over 500 species of birds recorded. How did we get so many birds? We have a huge number of native species, lots of non-native species that thrive thanks to our climate, plus lots of birdie visitors that pass through as they migrate along the Pacific Coast Flyway. Okay, so Californians can brag that they can ski and surf in the same day. Well, LA naturalists, we like to brag that we can see wild bighorn sheep and sea turtles in the same day. So we've got so many diverse habitats, there's a perfect place for just about anyone, including you. Leela? Yeah. Hey, I'm sorry, I'm so, I think I'm having a little bit of internet troubles. Um... Give me just one second. Are you still seeing my screen? I'm not seeing your screen. I just see all of our, well, my face and all of your blank boxes. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Sorry, students. Um, so Leela, can you tell us a little bit about how you ended up studying nature at NHM? Sure. So I study insects when I was going to college. And I just grew up loving nature in, um, when I grew up in England. So I got to play in the fields and pretend to be a badger. So I would walk out my back door, that's me and my sister, and both of us would do this together. So we would walk out the back door, go down a country lane, climb over an old rusty gate, go through a cow field, not standing in any of the cow patties, jump over a little stream and then end up standing underneath a grand old hollow tree. And I used to pretend to be a badger inside of that tree, crawling in through the hole, trying not to get spiders in our curly hair. That's where I learned to love nature. And then when I was 14, I moved from, oh, well, I moved from the countryside in England to Southern California's Inland Empire. And so I didn't so much have nature shock, uh, culture shock, but I had nature shock. I was used to living in this wild green place with woods and badgers. And then I moved to Southern California and lived in suburbia. And I was used to seeing these green hillsides covered in woods. And now I was used to seeing hillsides around here, especially in the summer, are kind of brown and dry looking. And I thought that that meant that they were dead. So when I started studying insects at UC Riverside, I started to realize that, oh, here's the pictures, they're coming. So I was seeing nature like this, and now I was seeing nature like this. And it wasn't until I went to college at UC Riverside and studied bugs for four years that I realized that that hillside had hundreds and thousands of insect species living there. So I love bugs. Um, and then fast forward to 2008 and I got my dream job at the Natural History Museum and this is LA. And so all of a sudden my family was like, what? 
why are you moving to LA, Leela? You love nature. There's no nature there. It's a concrete jungle. From the very beginning, I was out to prove them wrong. We are in a California, the California floristic province, a biodiversity hotspot. There are plants and animals that live here and nowhere else in the world. So let me share some of the things, the species that I've found here that I just love. Okay, so I found wild purple mushrooms growing in Griffith Park. I found the cutest baby octopus down in the tide pools in San Pedro. I found scorpions that glow under a UV flashlight at my favorite campground in the San Gabriel Mountains. This is wolf's milk slime mold. I swear it's not bubble gum that I stuck on a tree. This is a organism that grew out of the rotting trunk of a tree next to the LA River. I found orb weaver spiders building their beautiful orb webs on the men's restroom in Long Beach. I was down there specifically looking for spiders and I found hundreds and thousands of pollinating insects like this bee in our nature gardens at the Natural History Museum. And I got to help work on these gardens as a place for kids like you and young people like you to play, just like I played pretending to be a badger in England. Everyone deserves to have outdoor nature places to play. And so I wanted to help make that happen at the museum. And so we built this three and a half acre nature gardens and we are now open again to the public. So please come and visit when you can. That's awesome. I love hearing that story. Um, so you are obviously an expert on studying nature and observing nature. Can you kind of share some of your expert tips on how you observe nature with, with our audience? Great. Yeah. So I like to use tools. I One of the reasons I got into science is because tools were really fascinating to me. Um, so I'm going to share some tools that are like easy to find. So like th this is a kit that we have. Um, and it includes some really, really simple tools that you might have at home. So literally as scientists, we often use plastic spoons. I know you probably are like, what a plastic spoon? That's kind of boring, but it's really good for manipulating or moving small objects or picking up a tiny ant or picking up a pill bug or moving the soil beneath a tree to find the creatures, a tiny millipede maybe, that is living under there. So a spoon is something that we as scientists literally will use a plastic spoon. And then I might put that plastic, uh, the pill bug that I got with the plastic spoon into a Petri dish. And you could just use any sort of little plastic container at home. You could use a Tupperware or an old food container like a hummus dish. Um, and you can put the lid on and so then you can observe up close the creature. We like to use petri dishes under microscopes. We also have these things, which is basically just a plastic container, but we use the term vial. So that's the scientific word that we use, a vial, V-I-A-L. And this is for putting bigger insects in or bigger creatures, maybe a snail or a slug even. And if I'm trying to catch a bee or um, a dragonfly or a butterfly, I will use a tool like this. This is my butterfly net. And so you swish it through the air like this. It's really hard to show you on the screen. And I could catch a butterfly or a bee or any sort of flying insect in the bottom of this net. I would turn it over like that so it couldn't fly away. And then I would use this vial, put it inside and get the insect here so I could look at it up close. If it was a bee, I wouldn't have to worry about that bee stinging me. We also like have these little magnifier boxes. So sometimes you want to be able to see a tiny thing up close. So we use these magnifier boxes for that. Um, and last but not least, one of my most important tools is my phone. And I like to use a clip like this. It's got a magnifier on it. I line it up over my camera and then I can get really close and take a picture of tiny things like ants or tiny little caterpillars. And, you know, 
you can't do that without a magnifier because the picture would be really blurry and out of focus. So I get to use that for that. The last tool that I want to talk about is it's great taking pictures, but what if you don't have your camera with you? I also like to use my paints to document the species that I find. So I painted this mushroom. Very cool Amanita or fly agaric mushroom, also known as a toadstool. And I painted this praying mantis which I love praying mantids. And probably like the last one, one of my favorites, the lady beetle or ladybug. Did you know that they were, they were beetles? Yeah, it's a ladybug, but it's actually just another kind of beetle. So those are the tools that I like to use. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing those with us, Leela. Um, I, love to take pictures obviously of nature but i definitely find that when i draw or kind of write stuff down that's when i really kind of remember it best are there any other ways that you kind of help yourself remember experiences you've had in nature yeah i like to do this thing called memory mapping and i think we have some slides of some pictures of some memory maps so like i can remember in my head where and how i used to play i told you about those badgers um, so this is where I grew up in England, that house in the, in the kind of middle next to all the fields, that's where I grew up in England. And you can see that country lane that's going down towards all the fields. That's the way I would walk towards the badgers. Thank you for pointing that out. And so one day someone said, Leela, go back to where you were as a kid in your mind, shut your eyes and imagine going back there. Maybe all of us can for a second go back and imagine where we play, where we played as kids. And then after I did that activity of thinking and remembering, I decided to draw this map. And it is exactly that field of where I used to play and the badgers and um, the trees where I used to climb and would get stuck in. And there was a little stream and I built a little dam with my friends. And yeah, there was a pond in the bottom left corner where you can see that I used to go and collect frog spawn or the eggs of frogs. And um, then I'd take those eggs home and I'd watch them turn into tadpoles and then into frogs. And I love memory maps. So I did this one and I showed it to my mom and my sister and they're like, oh, I want to draw one too. And now I've collected hundreds of memory maps that people have drawn. And I just want to share a few from some of my friends. Well, this is another one I drew of my, of my own, but you can see the tree in the middle. That's the badger tree with the holes. That's where I used to pretend to be a badger. Okay. Now we're going to share some of mine from my friends. Okay. So this is my friend Andrea and she is an illustrator and a teacher and she wanted to share hers with watercolors. And so this is where and how she played as a kid. This is my friend Brad and he is a geneticist that works at USC and he grew up in Nova Scotia. And so he had a lot of snow and building snowmans and sledding. This is my friend Alphonse, who is a designer, and he remembers riding his bike around that cul-de-sac around and around and around. And one day he fell off his bike and he remembers how much that hurt in that crash, that bike crash. This is my friend Liam, who also works at the museum with me. He does the lighting and exhibit design. And you can see the little tiny rocket ship, him and his friends put a salamander in that rocket and made it go up into space. I don't think that salamander is doing quite so well. Um, so that's kind of sad. And I hope that he doesn't treat animals that way anymore. Well, I know he doesn't because we've talked about it. And this is my friend Una. Uh, this is from where she grew up in the Philippines. And I love that she had all of these amazing tropical plants and fruit and um, memories of all of those things in her backyard. Una is a nurse and lives here in LA, but this was her memory from where she grew up in the Philippines. 
And not everyone's into drawing. Maybe you want to make your own play memory map and you want to instead write. So this is from uh, someone who's a writer and it was really about like how they played in all the different rooms in their house and in their front yard. So it's really versatile. You can make a memory map or a play memory map from wherever you are. This is a picture of some of the memory maps that we have in our nature lab exhibit at the museum. This one is from Brian, who is our entomologist. Um, but my next one is the favorite is my favorite here. It's um, a picture from a local school, uh, Leopoldi Elementary. This is a memory map by Marlon, who is in uh, the fifth grade, and he drew this map of the schoolyard. And you can see it says, a garden spider made its own web and stayed there for a week. And then a little bit further over, one day a red-tailed hawk ate a pigeon in the tree in the playground. And then last but not least, a hummingbird got stuck in my classroom, 45. Everybody was saying, cool, how did it get in there? And so working with Marlon and a group of other students, taking these pictures of their schoolyard, we made a composite image with a professional illustrator. And now that image lives in the nature lab at the museum. This is that image. And I think the next picture is the students there on the first day of opening. And this is their story told in the museum to everyone who goes. They found nature, they are experts at finding nature, and we wanted to make sure that you knew their story. Wow, I loved seeing all of those different versions of nature memories. Um, and perhaps some of our participants um, will kind of think about some of their own nature memories and give the nature memory map a try. Um, so I think we are now ready to get into some questions. I know we've got a lot of questions um, coming in from students. Um, I'm going to start with one that we've gotten from a couple students. Kenny, Medina, Ariana are all wondering, um, you mentioned you love bugs. Do you have a favorite bug, Leela? Um, beetles are my favorite type of insect. I wear this necklace every day. This is a stag beetles, a brass, um, copy of a stag beetle's head. So those are its mandibles, those bits are its mandibles, which is a special name for mouth parts. So this helps to protect the beetle and it would go around like this. So beetles are my favorite. This is why I painted this ladybug. And um, I, there's one other beetle, let me see if I can find it right here that I painted, which is a beetle that lives in LA that you might've seen on the trails, this is a darkling beetle, which they often stick their butts up in the air just like this. Awesome. Beetles are super cool. And there's so many different kinds and they all look so different. I love that about them. Um, okay, so kind of along those lines, are there any like really cool bugs that you remember seeing um, in your childhood when you were in England? I remember um, trying to dig up an ant's nest when I was a kid. Sorry, ants. I really wanted to find the queen. I remember learning about um, that the queen lives in the middle. So I started to dig up the ants nest to try and find the queen. And I probably killed a bunch of ants. So that was really sad. We also had some really awesome bumblebees. And I remember taking a glass and putting them over the flower so I could observe the bumblebee. And then I got called into lunch. And I went inside, had lunch, came back out, and I, the poor bumblebee was dead when I came back outside. And that was the moment that I realized my actions have consequences. And I felt really bad for killing that bumblebee. But now I feel like the work I do today, helping other people to be interested in and learn about insects, help hopefully balances out that I killed that one bumblebee accidentally. I think so. <laughs> Um, cool. Well, Mrs. Amador's class is curious about kind of you talked about going on nature walks a lot when you were a kid, but is that still something that you do frequently today? Do you still go out like looking for bugs and trying to learn about them? Yeah, I like to go, I go out every day for a for a walk in my neighborhood in Koreatown. And so I'm always looking for the nature around me, even in the most urban part of the city. 
and um, I look for insects, I look for mushrooms. There are a lot of cool mushrooms that grow in people's yards around here. And there's also, um, remember that wolf's milk slime mold, the one that looked like bubble gum? Well, there's another kind of slime mold that's called dog vomit slime mold. And it's bright yellow when it's fresh, and then it goes, turns a pink kind of brown color, which is why they call it dog vomit, because it kind of looks like a dog was sick. Um, but it's actually a slime mold, which is a weird and interesting type of organism that's not a mushroom and not a plant. It's its own group of thing. It's a slime mold. Love all those names. <laughs> they really kind of paint a picture of what it would look like. Um, so you you obviously are kind of frequently out there interacting with different kinds of insects. We're getting a lot of um, questions from students that are curious about kind of any safety issues that are involved with kind of working with insects um, and if you have ever been bitten or stung by an insect when observing. So I remember getting stung by bees a lot when I was a kid. I accident, I would be in my backyard going around barefoot and the bees would like to be on the daisies, the same kind of flowers that the bumblebees would come to. And um, so I, I got stung by a bee on my foot when I was a kid. Um, and I was recently stung by a wasp. Um, and I was just walking along the road down towards the LA River and there, I happened to walk really close to a paper wasp nest. So they're the ones that make it, it's like, almost like a little umbrella made out of paper. They make paper. They were the original makers of paper. They go and find a fence, a wood fence or wood, um, uh, you know, any wood around and then they chew it off with their mouth and then they can turn it into paper. And that's what they build their nest from. And this was a paper wasp nest underneath a mailbox. And I walked close to it and the wasp were like we want to protect our sisters and the eggs that are in that nest and so i got stung on the leg and it really hurt and i got a i got really swollen um but i was able to take some uh um antihistamine and talk to my doctor and it was fine um i've never been stung by a scorpion i also love scorpions um and i've handled scorpions and I've had lots of um, stinging insects in my net and I've only been stung once while getting an insect out of a net. Sounds like in the times that it's happened, the animal's been trying to protect itself, but usually if you're kind of careful enough, it's okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, we have a question from Peyton who is curious about how nature is helpful. Like why, why do we need nature? Uh, well, first of all, we humans are part of nature. We are a living animal. We are an animal too. We're in the animal kingdom, right? We are a species on this planet. Um, so humans are part of nature and we are just doing the same thing that all those other animals and plants are trying to do. We're, they are just like us trying to survive, trying to find food, water, shelter, and then pass on the genetic material to the next generation. So just like we want to have families, some people, not all, I don't have any kids. I got my nieces, they're great. Um, but the human population at large, passing on the genetic material to keep our population going. The animals are doing the same thing. The mushrooms are doing the same thing. They want to pass along their genetic material so they can stay around on this planet. And this is our the only planet we have. So um, that's part of also the reason I do this work is so I can help to protect the nature that we have because if we didn't have nature like no pollinators then we wouldn't have food enough food to eat and so just like the animals rely on earth to survive we rely on the earth and all the other plants and animals to survive on this planet so we wouldn't be here if there were no insects we wouldn't be here if there were no plants i love that um Adriana is curious, you showed us some super awesome drawings that you did. How did you kind of learn to draw? Well, um, I have a friend called Adriana and she always says, we all learn to draw by writing our names. So I feel like that's true. When I sign my name, I am drawing. So you all can sign your name. You all can do a doodle on a paper. That is drawing. 
Um, but I kind of taught myself how to do these um, drawings of things like this. This is a pupa of a monarch butterfly. And I just, what I do is I look at the actual specimen or photograph that I took and just sketch it out, what it looks like. I did take a drawing class in um, college. A uh, It was like a pencil and pen and ink drawing class. And so I learned a few techniques there. Um, but it's just something that I've loved to do since I was a little kid. My grandma, um, uh, Avril Higgins, who was also really into badgers, um, she would have paints and things. And so I just started painting and trying out things out and to kind of see how it would go and try to get better. And, you know, literally that's why I like play memory maps is because you don't have to be a professional. You can just draw, this is that play memory map. You can just draw uh, stick figures and, you know, outlines. And this is just as valid a drawing or a piece of art in my mind as this beetle. Some people may say that this isn't as good. I think it's just as good as this, personally. Cool. I love drawing. Mine don't always look nice, but it's it's very relaxing just to look closely and and try to document it. Um, we have a question from Julie, who is curious if you have any tips for attracting kind of wildlife or insects to um, your yard or your home. Yeah, so I would definitely um, check out the National Wildlife Federation. They have a, um, a way to certify your yard as a wildlife habitat friendly yard. And the things that you need are the things that I already talked about. Just like we and all these other animals need food, water, shelter, we need to provide those in our yard. So having some water in your yard for animals to drink was good. Like my mom has a little bird bath. Um, uh, food, so plants, a lot of animals eat plants. So an oak tree is a really good example for some of the street trees that we have in LA. They provide a lot of home and habitat, those acorns but you probably don't have enough space for a huge oak tree. I live in an apartment, there's no oak tree here, but um, you could maybe have a little potted plant. I have some potted plants in my house. I could have one on my stoop that has some flowers and then bees could come and feed on the nectar of that plant and then also collect pollen to take back to their hive. So we can provide all the things that we need as people for bugs like food and water and, and shelter. That makes so much sense. Um, okay, so we have a lot of questions that are um, about whether you, Leela, have any pets, um, whether you have a pet bug, or if you don't, what would you choose as a pet um, <laughs> if you were to? I don't have any pets. Um... And I've just never really like grown up with that. My grandparents had some dog, they both were farmers, my grandparents. So they had dogs and some cats. Um, and then a my grandma had a donkey um, and farm animals. So like horses and things like that. Um, but I grew up living in the countryside on a farm and there were sheep in the field. So I would just go outside and interact with all of the amazing creatures around me and the amazing plants and mushrooms that were around me. So I don't have any pets at home right now. And I don't really feel the need to have a pet here at home. Um, I just get to enjoy the nature that's outside. I do love it when people tell me about their pets. Um, and I have a friend who works at the museum, his name is Nefty, and he has a lot of pets and he has lots of snakes and um, I think he has some hissing cockroaches and um, lizards of all kinds and varieties. And so he works in our herpetology department, which is the study of reptiles and amphibians. Awesome. You get to enjoy, enjoy other people's pets without <laughs> having to have the responsibility. I know pets are a lot of responsibility. Um, Connor is curious if you can like think of the weirdest organism you've ever seen and perhaps tell us about that. Hmm. Oh, the weirdest organism. Okay. 
So I really have got into lately these little creatures called sea slugs or nudibranchs. Um, and they live in the tide pool. So the picture you saw of the cute baby octopus in the tide pools down in San Pedro, well, there's also nudibranchs or sea slugs down in those um, tide pools. And they come in all different colors, but there's one around here called the Spanish shawl and it's purple with orange bits that come off the back and they can grow about this big and then they move like they look like they are maybe a little piece of fabric that's just in the water moving around but it's actually a sea slug and they come in all different colors and varieties and they are so cool and i love going down the tide pools especially with my magnifier here because that's a really great way to take pictures of them because some of them can be really tiny. There's one that's called an orange peel nudibranch because it literally looks like a tiny little bit of orange peel. I love nudibranchs. There's, you said they look kind of like fabric. There's one I think that lives in our area called a Spanish shawl that's like purple and orange and it totally just looks like a piece of fabric, just like you said. Um, so we have a really good question. You, you talked a lot about how you're kind of comfortable with bugs. Do you have any suggestions for um, maybe some folks that are less comfortable with insects, how to kind of get more, more comfortable? Yeah, I think, okay, so I know that we're asking about bugs, but pill bugs are not true bugs, right? They are what's called a terrestrial crustacean. So they're more closely related to uh, crabs and lobsters. They just live on the land and they have, insects have six legs, right? Two, three pairs on each, one on each side of the body. Um, but uh, pill bugs have like seven pairs. So like 14 legs total. Anyway, pill bugs are really good entry level bug because they don't fight, they don't sting, they can't hurt you in any way. And I think that that helps to alleviate some fear people have. Plus, you can, again, use your handy spoon to pick one up and put it into a little container, and then you can look at it up close and get used to it. And then when you start feeling comfortable, you could maybe let it crawl across your hand. And um, maybe you could hang out with some of your younger siblings who aren't scared yet, because I find that when we talk to young kids, they haven't developed a fear of insects or um, these creatures yet. And that's something that we kind of learn. It, I don't think it's innate within us to be afraid of a pill bug. It's probably innate within us to be afraid of a mountain lion because it's a giant predator and it could eat us. And we as humans are like hardwired to not want to get eaten. But a pill bug can't hurt us in any way. So like hang out with some of your younger siblings or with some other kids like who are into pill bugs. And maybe you can help to kind of get yourself more comfortable with a pill bug and then you could move on to like a caterpillar or maybe on to um like a ladybug or maybe on to some of the other more um larger species like a praying mantis that's a great tip so kind of easing in with some maybe things that are a little bit less scary like a roly-poly or a pill bug um, and then kind of working up from there so I think we are just about out of time for questions. So thank you so much, Leela. It was really awesome talking to you today. Um, and thank you to so much, thank you so much to all of our friends who joined us this morning. Um, we learned so much about the amazing and weird nature here in Los Angeles. And we really can't wait to continue exploring with you in this series. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen one more time so that you all can see the links, but thanks so much, Leela. Um, we loved hearing from you today. Um, now, if you want to see more from the Natural History Museum, you can give us a follow on Instagram at NHMLA. We'll also have all the videos from these presentations and others on our YouTube channel for you to watch later. Um, you can catch this recording and others at youtube.com slash NHMLA. And if you have a second before you leave, we hope you'll answer one more quick poll question on your way out. Um, and we look forward to seeing you again for future programs. Thanks so much, everybody.